welcome to the Destination Next podcast. This is a podcast hosted by me, Chris Hall, in collaboration with Sterka. With this podcast, we're going to be celebrating everything endurance, supporting the everyday athlete who are maybe not necessarily in the limelight. People are now going further, faster and better on the products they're training with and with the equipment they've got. Sterka offer a range of nutritional, carbohydrate-based products that are vegan and super friendly on your stomach. And you can use discount code NEXT10 at www.sterka.com to get 10% off your next order. Uh, so that it's done. <laughs> this first bit of conversation. I just do it so it's done. Um, congratulations as well on winning. That's pretty damn mega. Like, I'm kind of pretty honoured to have two winners of a race that I have not done and every single time I look at it and every year I'm like god it looks good it looks really good <laughs> well I've listened to your podcast with Mally and uh, we're gonna have to hold you to that one yeah he's turned he he was like he said to me afterwards he was like so uh you can add this to your list Ed. And I was like it's it's been on the list it has been on the list for a while um it's an excuse to see I'm a big believer that I'm very lucky that I've managed to cycle around in some incredible places around the world but i'm a huge believer that cycling in the united kingdom and um, in, and ireland and you know ireland wales scotland northern ireland england all of it is so much better than british people actually think yeah we certainly have some variety don't we yeah yeah <laughs> you can say that that's for sure and you know we look at uh we look at the pan celtic this year and the route really did tick off quite a dive but i mean it traveled far it traveled far it yeah. you, you guys you guys and girls you really sort of um i mean you've got to see probably some of the best of uh wales and then obviously you saw so much of ireland and then cutting back into wales again and you know that's i'm very envious of that ireland to me is one of those, those countries which i have continually looked at and gone god it must have been an amazing place to ride yeah, well, that was my first time in Ireland, so 1,400 miles on a bike was a, a good way to explore it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was like a sightseeing trip, actually. <laughs> it felt like a sightseeing trip, as you say. Yeah, it felt like, yeah, like nice. a sightseeing trip. So just to, to explain a bit uh, to people listening to this, I've got Paul and Simone here um, on this episode of the podcast. And Simone is the women's champion from the Pan Celtic uh, full distance, and you did it in seven days, seventeen hours, and thirty-eight minutes. And Paul is the men's champion of the Pan Celtic, and you did it in five days, eighteen hours, and twenty-eight minutes. And the distance that you were covering was like one thousand six hundred k, was it? One thousand six hundred no. miles. Let me get that. Two thousand six hundred kilometers. Um, no, no. 2350 or something like that yeah so it depends which which number you read because one of the routes does have the water the ferry miles on it ah so oh yeah 1600, just over 1600 miles but you take off a couple of well 100 and something just for uh, for, the, for the ferry miles well if you if you were sitting on your bike pedaling you can make it work as actual miles right yeah yeah so it, it was near enough 1500 miles yeah, and a lot of climbing because I mean you're following the coast for a larger portion of it. So, and I saw some of the photos, so I was just like, "God, that looks it looked brutal." Some of it, some of the climbing on that looked like there were a couple of distinct areas where it was quite flat. Yeah, uh, certainly at the beginning, about halfway, and then towards the end. Um, but yeah, in between that, there were some big hills, big sort of alpine type hills. And then there were just, like you described, that rugged coastline where you're up, you're down, you're up, you're down. Which I, I think that seems to be the nature of the whole of the United Kingdom. And I, I, I always think that, like, I always think the Southwest is some of the worst, most brutal riding I've ever done in the UK. Because it is like a sort of profile and they're sharp quite short but very sharp and steep and then down and up and down and up and down and I looked at the the elevation profile I've got it kind of opened up on the tab here and as you say it seems very much that kind of like middle block was very very spiky 
Yeah, I'd agree with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Simone with the big hills. I'm not sure how she fares on these little ones. <laughs> yeah, the little ones was the harder ones. The big hills I'm used to. So whereabouts are you based, Simone? Um, I'm based in Switzerland. Oh. I'm not I'm not native Swiss, I'm Austrian, but um, I have a lot of hills and uh, long climbs. Yeah. Yeah. Switzerland is uh, pretty spectacular as a country. Um, I did a ride from Newcastle to Verbia. And was it Verbia? Yeah, it was Verbia. And we kind of like cut, obviously finished in Switzerland, but cut into Switzerland for a few days of it. And it's just, I think Switzerland as a country is probably really underrated in terms of climbing and cycling. If you compare it, because I think a lot of people go, oh, the Alps, I'm going to go to, you know, France or you go to Dolomites, you're going to go to Italy. And they kind of, people seem to forget that quite often those passes, you descend down into Switzerland. Like it's the same bit, it's the same part, it's the same country. And I don't think, you know, we definitely don't have anything like the kind of climbing that you'd have in Switzerland in the UK. Like it's completely different sort of kettle of fish. We don't have the long, steady, you know, long, steady gradient climbs that are like 30 up to like I don't know, 30 kilometers long or whatever. It's like you get a 10K climb in the UK. That's a big climb, really. Yeah, I, I don't have big climbs at home. So I'm. It's uh, there are small climbs where I I'm based. I based in Basel. Yeah, nice. I have the advantage of um, to ride in Germany, in France, and in Switzerland. <laughs> and it's uh, three completely different uh, areas to ride. That's yeah. nice. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. It's really cool. Now, what for both of you? Uh, what made you want to take part in the Pan Celtic race? What was the thing that kind of excited you about that race? Um, I I started go and then I I'm pretty quick um, from my line into this ultra thing. I I uh, have a friend who's doing such things, and I was um, totally affected of the type of riding. <laughs> and then I I was searching for a race that I can do. In 2019, I picked Pankartic. Mm. And just sort of be uh, in the UK and in Ireland before, so yeah. Yeah. I think it's worth the land, worth the land, yeah. Yeah, great excuse to do it. Like, as you say, it was, you must have entered for the 2019 edition and then seeing all the cancellations and changes. And I mean, COVID is just completely. Uh, sort of changed the whole direction that the um, I guess the, the with ultra racing Paul and I were just talking about it a second ago like there's been so many cancellations of races or postponements in the ultra scene and it's really affected calendars for different people and like for me I've got uh, four ultra races in five months which is a bit bonkers and that's just from cancellations and things moving around but yeah, is what it is, the situation we're in. Um, how about you, Paul? What was your kind of... Yeah, so I, I spotted the Pan Celtic and put it on my list, so to speak, watching the first edition. And I, I loved the idea of the fact that they were, there were ferries included in the racing. Mm. So I, I was sort of excited by the idea that you had to, be, had to use strategy and take advantage of those ferries and things like that. Mm. Um, but I didn't do it that edition, um, but I entered... The next edition, um, and then COVID happened, obviously, um, and the edition. So that became the 2021 edition, uh, yeah. the second one, and um, that didn't have any ferries because they obviously had to simplify things due to COVID. Um, mm -hmm. But I came second, um, so it sort of became a new target to to come back to the event, and and I thought I discovered a little bit more about myself in in terms of racing and, and what I could achieve in that edition. Um, so I kind of wanted to push myself even more and chose to come back to the Pan Celtic where in this 2021 edition, there was the, the chance to use those ferries and, and have that thing that I was originally drawn to. 
It definitely adds uh, an interesting element to the race and to racing where we're seeing several races are kind of incorporating this now. So as you as you've incorporated the Celtic, we've got that. And another example that I could think of is uh, Transcontinental this year. There was a ferry. Um, and the one that I cannot pronounce the name of, so I'm going to absolutely butcher it, is uh, Grand Grand Guanch, Grand Guru, Grand, the one that goes across the Canary Islands, believe it or not. <laughs> Um, which incorporates about five ferries. So there's um, it definitely adds a very interesting element to to the ultra racing, as you say, because it becomes something that's maybe more tactical and understanding like, oh, actually, I've got five hours to get to this ferry. There's not a ferry. I could push myself and I'm going to be there for three hours early. So what's the point? You just rein it back in, you know, chill out a bit more and maybe not do as much damage as you would say if you were to absolutely bury yourself for a long period of time. And that definitely adds another element to racing, which is which is interesting, really interesting. Um, yeah, it's interesting that you put it like that off the top of your head, you know, talking about taking it easy to get to a ferry because I did exactly the opposite. I pushed <laughs> uh, to get to the ferry and then had a massive rest where I wasn't having to, uh, you know, wasting no time. And I honestly think that maybe some of my competitors automatically thought that soft pedaling to a ferry might have been the way to do it. Mm. But actually that extended their time cycling and maybe caused them to have a little bit less time resting. Yeah, yeah. there's, uh, there's probably a very fine middle point in it, I would imagine. Like, for me, I would go yeah. down the route of going, I probably wouldn't soft pedal, but I wouldn't go into the red a lot if I knew I had a lot of time to get a ferry. And, um, and that's just making decisions in the moment, isn't it? And uh, and having a bit of a plan as well. Mm, mm, mm. And there's always, I mean, there's always a thing with ultra racing is like, like you can plan so much, but in reality, you might as well just throw that plan away at the start and yeah. go a bit more, personally, I think, go a bit more on instinct. Uh, instinct. Right. Yeah. Because you just get to you know you don't know how you're going to feel the morning of the event and how you know it's little things like sometimes you wake up in the morning of the event and you just feel crap and that's just that's the nature of it I, like when i did uh, badlands last year i felt the first day i felt awful i felt awful all day i don't know i just had really bad headaches and my my guests just hadn't you know slept well or drunk enough and i was like well that's the situation i'm in now i'm gonna go right across spain for a couple of days um and things always happen on the road. Like, was there, for either of you, do, were there any particular, like, incidents or moments that got a bit, maybe where something went significantly wrong and how did you kind of overcome that as well? I'll let you go some more, ladies, first. Sorry, I'm... I, I don't understand the, the question. So was there anything, when you were riding, was there anything that went majorly kind of wrong? As in, were there any oh. mechanicals or anything like that? And how did you overcome it? Uh, no, not really. I, I actually had a really smooth uh, journey. Um, except one, one night, <laughs> I, I got a little bit sick. I, I think I ate something uh, wrong and I have to, uh, to vomit before I go to bed. And, but the next day, uh, it was okay. I was, uh, I think I was uh, 12 hours without proper eating, mm. uh, but I, um, I was okay the next day. So that's the, that's the, my only problem I had. <laughs> and I had one puncture that I have to, to, to put in a plug. Oh, that's fine. But, you got away lightly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you as well, because I don't think my race could have gone any smoother. Like I had no expected mechanical issues. And to be honest, mate, I was in such a zone regarding managing myself that I didn't really allow much room for any drifting of of that execution. If you like, you know, like I, I put myself in quite a, a place, uh, you know, not a very normal thing. If you know what I mean, like I, I, I didn't really allow for any tiredness or any negative thoughts. Um, you know, so I've got to say, like you know from that perspective i was a bit i was a bit like a machine just executing turning those pedals you know and it's not something that i think i could recreate you know unless there was another big dangling carrot you know i'm, I'm wondering where the next place is that i can execute that kind of um, 
psychology, if you know what I mean, because um, it definitely leads to a, an element of success, but you've got to be so heavily invested. You do, and I can I can fully empathise with what you're saying. Like when when I've been doing like the national t- the twenty four hour time trials, for example, where you you become a robot. There's no there's no simple way about that's, it. That's kind of, right. Yeah, so another way of putting exactly what I've just said. Yeah, I eat, I pedal, I keep going. That was all it was. Whenever I'd done them, it's like, oh, food straight in. Right, okay, ride. That was it. There was no emotion there was no um care there was no there's nothing else it was just right right 500 miles if i get to 500 miles i'm gonna get a good position that that's always the goal of the 24-hour time trialing yeah. and um you sort of negate the aches the pains you have to i really do agree with you you have to kind of take that emotion out of it and if you want to be competitive at the front end of any of these races and like I think we're seeing with a lot of the races that they're getting faster and faster and almost getting to that point now where it's uh, uh, what I'm quite liking what, what GV Duro are doing, for example, is that they're forcing it to be a staged race, yeah. you know, which forces people to have some time off the bike in between. I, I think that's quite, quite smart because I think people are, it's interesting. I was talking to, um, a few people who are doing Badlands about it and a photographer who's out at the Silk Road Mountain Race at the moment. And there's this, this aspect of like, some people's strength is not sleeping. That's a, some people naturally have that as a strength. Some people are incredibly gifted athletes. Some people are robots, you know, there's different strengths that everyone has. And we were talking about the fact um, that the concern of people riding at night a lot who are exhausted and you know potential for incidents crashes like we saw which happened unfortunately with mike hall in the indie pack race and i don't i don't fully i haven't very intentionally haven't fully read and understood the full incident of that and i, I don't really want to because it's just incredibly sad that we lost someone full stop uh, especially someone of his caliber in the ultra scene um but Everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses. And a lot of the guys I was talking to are like former um, European XC mountain bike camps and like, you know, pro, former pro triathletes, like incredibly gifted athletic people who are like, oh, we, we don't agree with the riding at night. Uh, you know, I know they're like, I know I can ride better if I have a good night's sleep. And then my argument was, I get you, you're an incredibly gifted athlete. So you naturally are a stronger rider. But the people to be competitive with you, there are people who can ride very well by riding through the night on very little sleep for two or three days to keep competitive with you. And that's what makes it exciting is that there's that so many different strengths and weaknesses that come into this scene that allow certain people to, I guess, perform or outperform maybe what you would naturally expect for them in some way. Yeah, so, so if there's one tactic that I sort of went into the pan race with this year it was to tread a tightrope between being able to string long days day on day and but also <laughs> take a risk in the racing aspect and potentially bonk i wanted to be on that tightrope where i hopefully by the time i got to ross Lair, was still able to pedal the bike but only just um so what you're talking about is, is pushing those boundaries isn't it it's it's taking less sleep than i've ever taken yeah. hoping that i just manage um whereas prior i probably had a few hours more per night and been a lot safer or safer in the strategy if you like safer that i would pedal all the way to to the end um without any significant i don't know fatigue issues or or whatever but um i think you're right i think these races have got seriously fast you know you, yeah. you're doing five days with a couple of hours a night and cycling for 20 you know it's it's uh, covering some really significant distances it's crazy and very little sleep and, and it you know you've got to think you know eventually there will be somebody falls asleep in a in a bad place while they're riding mm. and there's i'm very interested to know what the future of this is going to be because we're, we're seeing ultra cycling is still I mean, yes, it's been going for a long time. You could argue that the first Tour de France was an ultra race. You, you know, you could argue that. But in its current state and ilk, it's a 
part of cycling that's obviously not moderated by any cycling governing body. Uh, it's very much in this flow of, uh, you know, growing and developing and changing as the races grow and develop and change. We're seeing the diversity where we're seeing stage re staged races for ultra racing. We're seeing completely um, self-supported and self-sufficient races. We're seeing uh, routes that are pre-planned and designed for you, like the Pan Celtic, which uh, allows you to really see and experience the story and the journey that the organizer wants you to see. We're also seeing on the complete opposite contrast where you have to plan your own routes and you might have to ride certain parkours and segments. Um, and there's no wrong or right way to do it, really, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next you know, five to ten years. Is Does this end up becoming something that is governed and marshaled by the UCI who knows who who really knows and if it does does that take away a lot away from it you know personally I think it would take a huge amount away from it yeah it definitely would wasn't it I mean I would do the same again I would I would enter a race to push myself again um, yeah. I think you've just got to be in your own mind every now and again and and, and think am I safe and uh, I had a good chat with Kerry Middleton that came second joint second and, you know, he was very much chasing me um, on less sleep than I'd had. Mm. And I think he'd made a few decisions along the way to have naps and, and whatnot, you know, and, and maybe those adding up cost him catching the same ferry as me and, and, and the chance to battle it out for a win. Um, but it was the right thing to do because it was, it was about safety. Fundamentally, that's what I think, I think we all have to remember with these kind of races and events. And it's definitely been my set mindset on it is like, I'm paying for the pleasure of doing this and I'm incredibly lucky that I get to do this. Um, and my safety is paramount because I've still got to come home. I've still got to look after, you know, my dog, my partner, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I want to make sure I do come home. So I think we're, especially, we're, I've not actually, I'm, uh, tra uh, Trans Pyrenees will be my first road ultra. I've always done off-road. Yeah. And my mentality with off-road has been, uh, with Silk Road and Atlas Mountains and Badlands, my mentality has always been like, the moment I don't feel safe because it's proper sketchy descending or whatever, I'm going to walk a little bit, see how I feel. If I still don't feel good, I'm just going to stop. I'm just going to stop for the night because if I crap, I mean, the irony is, is half the time when you are riding some of the sketchy sections at night, you don't really know what's on either side of you, which is actually quite a blessing sometimes. Sometimes it's not a blessing. But Jim, I mean, I remember at Badlands last year, there's one section which I rode it at night and I then got saw photos of it in the daytime and I'm scared of heights. And I was like, well, it's damn good that I rode that at night actually because if I saw that and walked along this ledge in the middle of the daytime, I probably wouldn't have got across it very easily. Yeah. Uh, so the, but yeah, my mindset's always been like, you know, you push yourself as hard as you can, but it's important to, and, and you, as you said, Paul, there's a very fine line and there's a tightrope which you can ride on, but you get to that point where you're like, oh, maybe I, maybe that power nap for 15 minutes is actually going to be quite important right now because I can't see straight or whatever the situation is. And that's something I, I remember on the, um, with the last like big charity project I did, which was seven consecutive Everest, and I was descending down the climb and I was falling asleep descending. I could feel, you know, you like proper start like nodding like a dog. I could feel myself <laughs> doing that nodding. And my mate was in the car and he was like, and I just put my hand up, I was like, can I have a caffeine gel? I need a caffeine gel. I'm falling asleep. And he was like, do you need a caffeine gel or do you actually need some sleep? And I was like, Oh yeah, maybe just like 15, 20 minutes sleep would actually do the job instead of taking a gel and you know relying on that and then probably crashing afterwards. And 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 in reality, actually, because the problem I was finding is that when I was uh stopping to eat proper food, because we were trying to make sure I was eating proper food, when I was stopping to eat, my um my whole body was just shutting down because it was focusing on digesting. So I was falling asleep while I was eating. So we were like, oh, okay, actually tactically eat proper meal sleep for 15 minutes, have a, have a, an espresso before and then wake up and I'll be buzzing and I'll be forward. and it was good. So that was a tactic, but there's definitely, it's, there's so many, so many things that are, I feel are very up in the air with the ultra scene. Um, but I do, I think, I don't think any organizer is doing it the right or wrong way. 
I'll be honest. I think everyone's doing it right to what they want to achieve. And Pan Celtic is definitely what I like so much about the races. There is that community feeling and as they call it, the clan. I love that sort of aspect of it. And they're creating that um, family, so to speak. And the fact that they invest so much time in the route and trying to create a route that's incredibly beautiful and scenic, obviously challenging, but it tells a story of the journey that they want to tell. Yeah, and I think um, that's one good thing about, about being at the front of the race, isn't it? That the whole clan would have to cycle past you to um, be to have any trouble. <laughs> yeah, it's very you know, one, of them it's pick, one of them would pick you up. Maybe not the person in second, but uh, by the time yeah. you got down to fourth, somebody might pick you up. <laughs> yeah. no. I tell you, though, um, in the second half of the race for me, talking about tiredness, um, it was the short-term memory and the mental agility. So, you know, I, I'm... I get to the second half of the race and all I'm thinking about is what ferry am I going to get in Dublin? And I'm trying to do maths and I'm doing maths and it's taking me five or 10 minutes longer than it should to do a simple sum. Yeah. And then I'm, th I'm thinking to myself, right, I need to double check that now because I can't base my whole strategy on, on, on this. You know, I need to double check my maths. So I'll double check my maths. I'll come up with an answer. And then I'm like, actually, what was the answer I came up with the first time? I've forgotten already. I have having everything three times just to convince myself that my strategy and my numbers were right. Yeah, yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> it's um, it's funny how your, your your brain starts to kind of go a bit fuzzy about really simple things, isn't it? Or even yeah. like just going in. About times when I've gone on trips, I've gone into a shop and I've just been like, gone to pay for something, like some food. <laughs> and then realised, I don't know what my pin code is. Wait, is this contact? Is this, is this like, I know this is a contactless card, not contactless card but I'm like, God, what the hell is the pin for it? I don't know what the pin is. The contactless limit is hundred pounds in the UK. Like you, just, you're not going to yeah. spend hundred pounds on food unless you go to someone very like the swankiest of Marks and Spencers. You're not going to spend hundred quid. And I'm sitting there. About the times I've been there going, shit. I don't know what the pin is. I don't know what the pin is at all. I haven't got a clue. And then it doesn't it compute. I could just go. Boop. You've got the other option. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a bailout option. It's contactless. Um, and what in terms of bike setups because people are always fascinated in bike setups uh let's individually run through your chosen setup for the races like in terms of your bike your gearings your bags and any kind of particular thing that you took that was like everyone's got something that they take that's like the their thing they will never not ride about and mine i have two one is a small portable camera because i like to take a camera to take photos i don't like to use my phone and my other one is an electric toothbrush which everyone thinks is really weird but i'm so so funny about dental hygiene um but i take always take an electric toothbrush i'm not one of these guys that scrimps and cuts a toothbrush in half i'm taking my freaking electric toothbrush and i'm brushing my teeth for five minutes i don't care um, <laughs> That's that's uh, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> no one expects the electric toothbrush, but honestly, the the reason why, genuinely, the reason why is one. I'm very particular about dental hygiene. Like I've I had uh, I I used to play rugby at quite high level. Kicked in the face several times. Standard rugby. Um, had one tooth completely knocked out, and the other tooth half knocked out. So I've got two teeth missing here and here, um, and one of them got infected and was just very painful for a very long period of time and then having cycled a lot i had a i had quite thin teeth so i spent quite a bit of money on sorting that out and now because of that i'm very anal about my teeth because it cost me a lot of money to sort them out and i don't want them to be i don't want them to be in that situation again they're not fake they're real they're still my teeth but that's why i'm particular about it um Admittedly, on races where you maybe don't have places to charge an electric toothbrush, it is problematic. But it's one of the things that is like my my no compromise is an electric toothbrush or a very 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 good toothbrush. Yeah, um, well, I take a good toothbrush as well. I quite enjoy brushing my teeth on the morning. It's like a part of the routine for starting yeah. a new day. It's a good way to wake up as well. I always found like yeah. when I brush my teeth, it's like oh okay, I suddenly feel like more awake all of a sudden. <laughs> So I have, a, I have a quite an overriding memory of this year's race of being in Connemara. So the sort of northwestern part of the route. 
was particularly spectacular and I, I got that at, at sunrise and I can remember the sun coming up, mm. looking at the awesome mm. view and brushing my teeth. <laughs> <to the end. laughs> Dead to high is important, people. <laughs> Especially of all the shit that we eat on these kind of things. It's so important. Yeah. yeah. So what what was your let's go Simone first. Like what was your bike setup? Um and what kind of things did you take on the bike with you? Uh yeah. Um I'm riding a t- titanium bike, Enigma. Mm-hmm. It's a custom size, so my bike is really small. <laughs> um, I am riding 650B wheels with uh, 28 millimeter tires. Yeah. Um, nine and a half. That's uh, really important for me to be sufficient with my my energy. Yeah. Um, yeah, because my bike is so small, I have a frag, a full frame bag. A full frame bag is four and a half liters. <laughs> wow. And my bottles are um, uh, in behind my behind my uh, paddle uh, yeah. with this visualized uh, things. Yeah, that's that's uh, good. I just see the photo of the setup. It's, yeah. it's really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's it's important for me. <laughs> of, Otherwise, I have to to uh, take a backpack. I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you you're running Apertura frame full frame bag, rear pack, top tube bag, and then it looks like you've yeah. got a um, and a little bag. Pouch. Sorry. Have you got like a food pouch kind of thing in the jib? Yeah, I have a food pouch. Yeah, but I think it's the bag I I use. Um, not really. I don't know. I I think at the next race I can um, leave it at home. Yeah, it's I don't like it really that much. They're they're, they're funny those food pouches because like the moment I I always found the moment that I would get out I like them because of the convenience of them, but the moment I would get out the saddle they became really annoying. Yeah. Yeah. Because it just like clips onto your knees or something, and it's like, oh god, this bag it just became. It's my hand always stuck in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the bike's the bike's lovely, as you say. It's very, it's compact, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's compact. She's yeah. got Lola. <laughs> She's what? Sorry. She's called Lola. Lola, how come Lola? Lola. Yeah. Um, yeah, but in my bags, um, there is a full uh, sleeping kit with yeah. uh, ultralight BV mat and sleeping bag, down jacket, um, a set of long bass player, and a second pair of clock, mm-hmm. bib short. Yeah, take a second bib short with me. Yeah, that's it. And a rain jacket. Yeah. And I had a shield jacket with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I always think. Um, I always think people often. I'm a big believer in taking two sets of bib shorts after when I did Badlands last year. And I did it with one set of bib shorts, and it was not a. Uh, it was not a wise decision, shall we say? Definitely having two bibs. I think it just allows you to have a bit more uh, comfort. At points, yeah. yeah. But the bike looks fantastic. It's, it is a really small frame, isn't it? How, uh, if you don't mind me asking, how tall are you? I'm one fifty three. One fifty three, and yeah. <clears throat> did you find that going to the six fifty wheels helped in terms of how the bike would handle as well? Because quite often. Uh, smaller right there's there's unfortunately there's not many bike options out there really for I, I, I think for smaller riders do you think quite often they, they do a 700c wheel on a small frame and a lot of people who I've spoken to in the past say it just makes the bike feel really weird how it handles yeah I think um I, you, I don't have a really toe overlap yes yeah. um, I think that's really important and um, 
I I have another bike, a Kenyan Endurance. It's mm. the uh, smallest size and it came with the 650B wheels. And I like it. I like the handling. It's it's more natural than than with 700s. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Definitely. The, I mean, the bike setup uh, looks yeah. super neat. Yes. It makes things complicated a little bit. <laughs> Is it like getting hold of inner tubes and that kind of thing if you need to? Yeah, I, I, I think I don't would have the chance to get another tire if something is with my tire yeah during an old race i yeah i'm done and how how have you mounted the bottle cages to the side of the aperture bag um the it's um it's an aluminium cage it's called wohu saddle stabilizer Ah. It's mounted uh, underneath the saddle. Yeah. And you can uh, mount the bottle cages at the sides. It looks really it's neat. A, it's a yeah, yeah, it's really neat. Really neat. I've not, I've seen a few people do it, but I've not really heard people i've seen people talk, talk about doing it but i've not seen it in action if that makes sense so it's quite nice to see it in action it looks really cool in case in case you're wondering i'm i'm looking on your instagram at a photo of your bike right now that's why um i'm asking so many questions about it it looks it looks fantastic like it's cool yeah, it's, it's cool it's like love yeah yeah, yeah. And Paul, what did you uh, what did you ride, and what did you take for yourself? So I ride a Cannondale Synapse. Um, yeah. I have some restrap bags, frame bag, top tube bag, uh, an Apogee saddle bag, yeah, um, a canister bag which just has my bivy in it and a mat, um, and then I also have the, the the pouches at the front, but they're slung in front of the handlebars on the aero bars. Works really well that way, doesn't it? And actually, I started that, the race with those empty. I didn't really know how I was going to use them. Yeah. Um, in the in my mind, I wanted space for plenty of food, knowing that shops would probably be closing around eight pm and not open until eight pm. And the fact that I was planning on cycling all hours, mm -hmm. uh, I wanted a bit of flexibility for for water, so potentially yeah. four bottles. And that, and given the way, that's what it ended up being. I ended up with two LucasAid bottles that I bought in the first 24-hour garage. I went into and I, I refilled those right till the end. Um, yeah. So I was carrying four bottles most of the time, which just allowed me to, to do 100 miles without stopping, basically, every time. Um, yeah, yeah. So my Apogee saddle bag was only half full, and that allowed me to stock up on an evening. Um, so on an evening, I'd, I'd stop for some sort of decent food, if you like, uh, like an evening meal. Even if that was just a sandwich, I'd actually sit down and have that. But I'd really stuck at that point um, to get me through the night and probably ride myself with breakfast prior to the shops opening. Mm -hmm. so I had a bit of redundant space at the start that then I used later on. It's quite, a, I think it's a, a good tactic to go into it having, um, you know, like the spare space to be able to eat into. I really do because you kind of, you give yourself the option there because the amount of times that I've gone and done stuff and I've just been like, oh man, I wish I had a place that I could put such and such in it. It's normally, yeah. food is normally the one as well as having an extra space for a bit of food. That yeah, yeah. Your pockets can get quite full and you can carry 12 hours worth, you know. I mean, I'm quite a big eater, so um, I need a bit of space. Mm. And you... Yeah, my, my, my frame bag was only for food. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were my, my electronic stuff and food yeah it just <clears throat> i think it's the thing that people often underestimate with any kind of long distancey thing is how much food you do need to eat and it's not just you had to always remember like you're fueling for the day's riding that you're doing but you're also preparing for the next day and mm -hmm. You don't want to go into the next day sort of feeling fatigued or like you haven't eaten enough. And I, I mean, I've, I've done that mistake before. I think everyone's done it before at least once or twice where you've gone, oh shit, I've not, I've actually not eaten well enough for the next day, which could be another, what, you know, 
10, 20 hours, whatever on the bike I've cocked up. Um, there's definitely a lot of people who have that, who've done that at least once. I think I've definitely done it several times and just realized I'm really fucked up. Well, you, learn, you learn quite quickly, don't you, to not, to not yeah. allow that to happen. It's not very nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly that. You, you learn to slow down when you put yourself in that state and make that mistake. You know, every mile is good. It's taking three. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're completely right. Now, and the the synapse as well. Like, I mean, I, I I get the the benefit of a titanium bike is incredible. Like, that there's very there's many known benefits to titanium for ultra riding. Um, Enigma, um, whether it's Enigma, or it's Curve. There's lots of Thai brands that are producing these fantastic bikes, which are foc- focused more about, I guess, ultra stuff. But then, as you say, the synapse. Uh, or synapse. I've heard some people pronounce it before, which is endurance bike, isn't it? For me, it's it's just so comfortable and fast. You know, I've got fast wheels on there that um, actually a friend in the Pan Celtic made up for me. They're they're custom with a dynamo in the front as well. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, alt alt wheels. Um, <laughs> you know, you can make your bike feel so nice. You yeah. know, even with the the luggage on it. I agree. I agree. And yeah, you you're running. Uh, quite a deep section, real like 40, 40. It looks like a 40 on the front and maybe a 50 on the back. So, yeah, about that. Back. it's just over 50. Yeah, yeah, 32 yeah. mil tires, tubeless. Perfect. Um, yeah, comfortable. Yeah, Save yeah. My- and what, what, um, what gear ratios are you riding? It looks like a standard compact at the front, uh, yeah. and it's 11 on the on that. Nice. It looks great. It looks really cool. I'm a big. I'm a big fan of Canada. I think they make fantastic bikes. I've always been a big fan of them, and I think the Synapse is probably like one of the most underrated bikes that Canada has actually done. It's so versatile. I've done the National 24 and the National 12 on that bike, and gone ah. okay. In fact, I was at the 24 that you're talking about. I think where you hurt yourself. 20. Were you there? Did you 2019? 2020 wasn't it? 2020. It was during COVID, wasn't it? It was one of the ones that happened during COVID. So tw- the is twenty, the last twenty four I did was twenty nineteen. I was meant to do twenty twenty. Uh, I that one. But, you remember all, you the whole gang there, didn't you? you yeah, know, yeah, uh, yeah. It sounded about. It was a right laugh. It was yeah. uh, twenty twenty. I was supposed to do, but I'd injured myself at the twenty twenty um, national hundred. That's right. You're you're right now. I've remembered twenty twenty. The only event that ran. Was it was during COVID? It was the National Twelve that I did in twenty twenty. Yeah, but yeah, I did. It on that bike. Uh, I made it a little bit more aggressive. Obviously, took everything off it, and um, you know, it sat at 22, 23 mile an hour, no problem. Yeah, people. I think I re- I'm a big believer that for ninety five percent of people in the world, an endurance frame like geometry bike is the bike that they need. It might yeah. not be the well, best. I've had many bikes in the shed and I've gone to two now. I've got a gravel bike and I've got that bike. You could also put gravel tires on the synapse. <laughs> yeah. 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 Could go to one. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'm 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 I, the the reason reason why I say like the endurance geometries I think are the bikes that most people should go for because I I have a Cervelo Caledonia and I didn't want to like it. <laughs> I, I didn't want to like it because uh, I had a, previously I had a Cervelo C3, which was like very much, it was kind of a gravel bike before gravel bikes were a thing. Um, but it was kind of the bike that didn't, no one really knew what it was. Um, and so people that rode it, it got amazing reviews, but then people who just didn't ride it and sort of heard about it were like, oh, it's kind of a weird bike. I don't really know what it is. And then they brought out the Espero, which is very much a racing gravel bike. And then the Caledonia came out, uh, I think... I can't remember it came up before or after, but I, I have a Caledonia and uh, I did this like ride around Switzerland, uh, ride around uh, Spain with one of my mates and took the Caledonia when I literally had just got it, took the Caledonia and I was like, God, this is, this bike feels great loaded. And quite often you jump on a bike when it's loaded and you're like, oh, it feels like a, a horse or a donkey with bags on it or something. But I was like, God, this bike actually feels good loaded. Like, cause it's such a stable bike. And then I was like, do you know what? In reality, the, uh, the, these kind of like endurance style bikes now, they're looking very similar to 
uh, a racing bike. You know, you think the Caledonia is a bike that they use for Paris Roubaix, like it's 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 fine for ultra for you know for the pros to use. And the Synapse as well has been used for Paris Roubaix as well. Like those kind of bikes actually are very versatile, and the geometries of them are probably a bit more kind for a more day to day rider. Um, in my opinion, um, there's definitely someone who's going to tell me I'm being, I can shut up and I'm being an idiot, but a bit more relaxed bike is great. You don't need to be super aggressive all the time. So my bike prior to this one was a, a Cannondale 6 high mod carbon, and it wasn't the bike for doing endurance rides on. Yeah. They've got far more significant hand issues. Yeah. Uh, in that. It was an awesome bike and I absolutely loved riding it. Um, yeah, I think you're right. A subtle difference uh, can actually go quite a long way if you're specifically wanting to target longer events. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and you both were riding Dynamo Hubs, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't without it now. I now that's something I completely agree with as well because there's it just gives you that. What what lights were you both riding with the Dynamo? So I have, ex, I have exposure lights, but interestingly, I just charge it up from the uh, USB. I, I literally just have a USB plugged into the Dynamo and everything. And that's just a bit of an evolution thing. I've just not got any further with it yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, have a, I have a battery powered exposure light, which is brilliant. And I've, I've not gone any further with it yet. But you know, is that one it, of the, um, the Strada ones? Yeah, it lasts forever. That big monster one, Strada thing. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, with my Dynamo, for about three or four hours, it'll get up to 80% from whatever 20%. So, you know, enough to get through the night plus with just a couple of hours charge. It's a great way. It's a great, to be honest, it's a great way of thinking about doing it. I hadn't thought about doing it that way because um, I've got this door now. There we go. Um, with lighting, I think lighting is and sort of charging battery packs, etc., is always a thing that people are quite confused about what the best solution is with in terms of dynamos, etc. And I, I've always gone down the route of going, maybe it'll be a different mentality for road ultras, but definitely for off-road ones is I take this exposure as strata, but then I also run a dynamo light at the same time. And the reason for that is that I like, to, and I also take a helmet light. But with the off-road stuff, it's just the more you can see, the better when it's technical. Um, but going down the route of actually using the Dynamo's charge of battery pack seems like a very... Yeah, so I had also one small battery pack, very small. And that was just like a bit of a buffer safety blanket, if you like. But I just found that I, I can just charge everything once a day. So <clears> the <throat> night I plug the light in and get yeah. a bit of charge. In that. I probably have to charge the phone once a day. And and then the Garmin, I actually have the, the, the piggyback battery underneath that. And that's really good. good about 36 hours a day and a half probably crazy good isn't it that battery you yeah. can have on the bottom of it um so you know it was only plugged in i only had something plugged into it half the time yeah nice it's a good way of doing it and it's similar. about as simple as you can get but like i said it's a bit of an evolution you know i've got some good gear that runs off batteries and then i've ended up with a dynamo as well so whether i'll get a light a front light in the future i mean i probably will try it we'll see yeah, I've got the, um, I tried the exposure um, sort of dynamo lights and I thought it was pretty good, but I, I've recently sort of, well, last year I moved over to K-Light, which is, um, yeah. I'm not sure if it's Australian or a New Zealand brand. But, it's um, New Zealand, isn't it? I looked at his USB, the, the guy's the USB. Whole, yeah, the whole yeah. setup of it is very simple. It's just plug and go. And that's what I quite liked about it. It's very easy to set up. You don't have to overthink it. Um, so, man, what light system were you, was you, were you using for it as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm using the Thinwave um, front light yeah. with the USB uh, hub, uh, with yeah. the USB um, to plug in. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and the Supernova uh, real light. Yeah. And no, how, and really light. And I'm guessing that that's a light that's got really good reviews and feedback as well. People seem to be really positive about how good they are as an ultra bike packing light as well. Yeah, so I can charge my battery, my, my battery pack uh, from the light directly. Yeah. And from there I, I uh, charge my my stuff. Nice. I mean, um, I think when you get down and dirty with stuff like this, you, you, you're making yourself more resilient, but it comes with a layer of complication, doesn't it? 
Yes. And I think yes. the simpler you can you can keep it, the better. Um, I agree. It's, you, you, it's very easy to overcomplicate that whole system. And um, I, I definitely found for Badlands, the k Light combined, the k Light system with their, um, like, uh, I don't even know what they call it, like currency regulator box thing yeah. uh, to charge from. That whole system was really, really slick. I was really impressed with it actually, and it's all. And I found that the I got the um, the ultra. I think it's the, called the Ultra V two or something like that, which is their the latest one, which was set up. Uh, and they do like a road and gravel one, and they do an off road one, and it's to do with the different beams of the lights because there's three lights in it, and it works with the different beams. And I found that the um, the one I've got, which is the road and gravel one, actually is incredibly bright. For a simple setup and the reason for using the the strata was basically first of all because i could just go there's a torch you know i could take the it's clip take it off the thing and i've got it as a torch and then the other thing was it was, as i said for some of the really gnarly stuff at badlands it was like oh I, I need to see everything right now because oh look there's a there's there's a you know there'd be a technical like a downhill section or for a mountain bike and you're like oh i need to obviously find the fine best line to go down this as opposed to relying on sort of blindly kind of seeing roughly the outline and shadows of a few rocks i want to actually see the whole thing and know actually maybe i'll go to the left as opposed to the right because the right looks like it's a meter drop while the left is actually smooth um that's definitely uh happened a few times on the off-road stuff where you're just like shit that wasn't what I expected that to look like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and what what are you both thinking is going to be? Have you got any ideas of what's going to be the next race that you're going to target? After both, you know, winning the Pan Celtic, there's got to be another target afterwards. Simone, you've got a, like a smile on your face, like, oh yeah, I've got something lined up. Yeah, it's not that not that much time to go <laughs> there. Um, I will race the Trans Pyrenees too. Oh, you're doing Trans Pyrenees? Yeah. Oh, we'll have to. We'll definitely meet at the start, and then I'll let wave you away. <laughs> so there are some things to clear with my employer, but I I hope and I think it's it's gonna gonna work bit there. Yeah. It should be interesting i i'm i've looked at tra the trans pyrenees that every time i look at it i'm like this is of the ultra races this is the one that suits me the least because there's so much climbing in it but as we sort of said at the start like when you're on a loaded bike it starts to become a real leveler of everyone the climbing does everyone seems to climb relatively the same kind of speeds but yeah it's going to be a bit of a brute isn't it have you got all your routes planned no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you there. I'm <laughs> I've done a first draft. Oh, really? Yeah, I've done a first yeah, draft. Yeah, I've tried, but um, Komoot uh, failed me out, so I have to to do another one. Yeah, I, I did my first really draft. Tried. Yeah, Komoot we'll changed the, the parkours. Yeah. While working on it, yeah. so I, I have to to start again. Yeah, I saw that but, as well. They changed the parkour. I think it's not really that much planning yeah. for this race. I, I do think sometimes it's better to go into it like a bit more naively. I, I, I'm a big believer if you go into it a bit more naively, you don't overthink it. You generally will do better because you, you overthink it. Well, for me anyway, I'm not, it's not the same for everyone, obviously. But I've always found if I overthink these kind of things, I just end up like being like, oh, this isn't going exactly how I thought this was going to go. And you can't do that with bikepacking races and ultra stuff. You can't over... For me, it's like you have to plan things very much on the fly. Like on Trans Pyrenees, for example, we might end up going down a road, realizing that the freaking road's closed. It's just you've got to go. Oh, you can't go. Wow, well, some people get really flustered by it, but in reality, you just turn around and find another road. It's the nature of it. It's fine. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm the the complete opposite uh, of Paul because I think Paul uh, plans his ride really. Um, Really exactly, and yeah. uh, it's for me. I'm, I'm just at the Pancaltic. I, I had this a little plan till the top at ferry, 
but then I just go and um, I like it like that. As part of sleeping when I'm tired and um, go ahead afterwards. Yeah. Good way of doing it sometimes. It, it, there's definitely strengths and weaknesses to both. 100% strengths and weaknesses to both. There really is. Really is. Paul, what's your what's your plan for the so, next one? As you know, I've just ridden London and London. Um, so I, you know, I had that entry and along with the Pan Celtic from you know the back end of last year. So that was an enjoyment ride. I enjoyed riding that. There was no big big pressure to get around that particularly fast. Um, but after the Pan Celtic, I felt like I wanted to do something else. So I've entered um, a new race in Sardinia, which is called uh, UBS 790. So it's only 790 kilometers. Uh, it's very hilly. Um, and it's a new race, so we'll just go and see. It's lots, lots of Italian men seem to have entered it. So mm. um, we'll see how fair against them. And when, when is that one? <laughs> That's October. Nice. That'd be that'd be lovely. So nice time. And I've been yearning since before COVID to get out and ride an event in Europe. So and I love Italy. So um, why not? Yeah, why not exactly? And Sardinia, that that will be stunning. I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah, I've ridden in the south um, of Sardinia, so this is very much a loop of the north. Mm. So, um, and and like I say, it's quite up and down, and, I, and I'm not the most natural climb, but, you know, I think it's an endurance race, so that's that becomes the most important aspect, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's all about, um, at the end of the day, it becomes a, who can endure, literally, in the distance and the terrain that's coming throughout. I mean, we've all got an elevation to do. Um, so yeah, it's sort of a, a good leveler, isn't it? Even if you're not a good climber or you're not good on the flats, you know. Yeah, you, yeah. There's always something. There's always something. Leveled by the endurance aspect, very much. And equally, one of the things that I really enjoy about the endurance side of cycling is it's a leveler in terms of uh, people's individual strengths, whether that's going uphill, downhill, flats, you know, off road, on road. It's a great leveler in that sense. But also in relation to your gender, I think it really is a leveler, as we're seeing more and more women coming through now in the ultra scene and I, I'll always refer back to Fiona when she won when she won Transcontinental the previous edition and still like she had an amazing race this year like yeah where would she be if she hadn't had, had all the stuff stolen she'd have been yeah. up there wouldn't she? <laughs> she would have been well up there like and and another example is Leo Wilcox is just like an absolute rock star when it comes to the ultra scene and taking like fastest known times and things like that. Um, she's doing Badlands, which I'm proper excited about because um, I've never met her and she's like a bit of a hero. So it'd be really, really cool. Um, well, I think Mally's trying to talk her into coming to the Pan Celtic as well. So that would be cool. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> <clears throat> she just seems like a really nice person. <laughs> And that, I definitely think that's one of the things with ultra stuff is there's um, a vibe of community. And I think what Pan Celtic has done really well has created that community more so than quite a lot of the other races. And I think a lot of the proof in that comes down from the amount of people that do it again every year. Like it's quite high. Yeah. yeah. And they don't just embrace you as a rider, you know, they welcome that your family as well, you know. Um, I, you know, I've got a little team here of uh, a partner and two girls who come to the finish line and play with the, the organizer's dog and wait for me to arrive. And, you know, it's just nice that you go to their events and you're the rider, but they want to see you and everything else about you, you know. Um, yeah they're interested in the other side of you as well. You know, yeah, it's great to be celebrated as the winner, but um, it's also nice to sit there and talk to the organizers with your kids sat on your knee and listening to them talk about what daddy does as well, you know? Yeah, that must be really lovely having that kind of moment to share with your kids as well. Yeah, and I, I mean, you, you can get that yourself, can't you? But the Pan Celtic draws it out of everybody as well, you know? There's, there's something about that event that draws that aspect out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's really nice you know it's quite infectious it makes you want to go back yeah yeah, yeah definitely I, I every every story I've heard from the race I've just been like man it just I get the good positive vibe from it which is 
fundamentally the most important thing and and is and it also to be honest is the reason why I'm, I'm going back to do badlands again is because there's the organizer yeah. david is a really lovely very humble very humane kind of person very um you know uh he the people who don't know i have an association with a number which is 107 um i have done lots of charity projects around the number 107 which is a because I fundraise for a kids charity, which looks after 107 kids for cerebral palsy. And um, I've done it for, I've sort of worked, it's a, it's a school called the Pace Centre, and I've done it for years now. And there's a reason why I have 107 on my arm. Like, it's a weird number that seems to follow me around. And anyway, this year for Badlands, they released the start list, and David, the organiser, put me down as cap 107. And... Yeah. And he was just, and like didn't even discuss it. Just like I thought you'd like that. It was a really nice little touch. Yeah, and I think that's something that's in the ultra scene, isn't it? This connection to the organisers. Yeah. You know, you don't get that. You don't get that at a sportive in the UK, do you? No, no, definitely not. Definitely not. Here's the money. Here's a route. Yeah. You go. <laughs> go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a different, definitely a different mentality. And and, and what tips would you both give to anyone? Uh, who, as two winners, I'm going to keep saying it because it's cool that you both won. What would there be any tips you'd give to people who uh, are looking to tackle their first ultra race? Yeah, I've got a good one. You're going to like it. Listen to other people's experiences on podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, I've I've learned I've learned a lot through riding. Yeah, but then I've also learned a significant amount how to progress my own riding by listening to other people's mistakes, other people's successes. Um, and I do that through, through the media of podcasts on my rides. Mm. Uh, you know, for example, Fiona, you know, how metronomic she was when she won the transcontinental was something I emulated this, this time. Um, did it my own way because I had my own experiences. Um, but I've learned from that. And then, and then mistakes. I mean, mistakes are just great stories, aren't they? But, but you, it's like pre-learning so that when you find yourself in the same situation, you're like, ah, oh, shit, yeah, I'm not going to make that mistake because I've listened to a podcast of somebody else making that one. Yeah, exactly. It's a really good way of thinking. I mean, it's it's just show. about learning yeah. learning scenarios, isn't it? And and pre, pre-loading your brain full of all these scenarios that you might encounter. Mm-hmm. Um, you can do that. You've got to do it through experience as well. But um, I quite enjoy listening to people's stories and I've learned quite a lot. I'm the same. That's the reason why I have a podcast is because I listen to lots of podcasts and I like listening. And I find them very good to listen to when riding. Yeah, it, you, know, you can go into a nice little place, can't you, on your bike? And I think spoken stuff in your ears is probably a, a bit safer than music. Yeah. In my, in my mind. Where yeah, listening, listening to good, it's like death metal or something yeah. where you're going along. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've definitely been that person listening to very heavy music and I've like, been riding really hard and going, oh, shit, I need to rein this back a bit. I've done that a few times and really got into the mood of the song. You know, some crap like that. It sounds good, doesn't it? Um, but podcast, as you say, podcast is a great shout. Um, not that we're recording a podcast episode or anything. <laughs> listen, 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 listen. Um, how about you, Simone? What kind of tips would you have for anyone that's like coming into the ultra cycling scene and, and looking to do their first ultra? Yeah, I'm totally agree with Paul. Um, taking advantage of other people's experiences, but also, um, yeah, just go, just go out there and 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 do it. I think. Um, Especially uh, women, there are so many women who wanted to do such things, and um, yeah, there. I think there are often too many fears around. Mm-hmm. So um, just go out there and do it. There's nothing bad to happen. So there's so many. <clears throat> the, I think the organisers now as well are so more and more organisers as well. Let's say as you know, as things have progressed over the last couple of years, are really supportive in wanting to just get people to enjoy and experience what they want you to experience, whether, and it doesn't matter if you're uh, male, female, non-binary, gay, straight, black, white, whatever, 
they don't care about that they're looking for people to come and enjoy and experience and challenge themselves and um you know of course you're you're both winners but it's everyone that takes part you know to commit to i'm a big believer that committing to doing one of these you're already winning being at the start line because you've committed to challenging yourself physically and mentally on something that's incredibly hard like much harder than uh you know i I always think about it like there's so many people on the ultra scene who've got normal day jobs as well and you know like both you like still got normal jobs still got to you know pay the bills and stuff and you go and do these incredible feats of human performance and then go back to work like That, that's what that's what's so beautiful about ultra cycling and why i think the organizers are so supportive of anyone and everyone that wants to do it and very much as simone you say is just go and do it and you know the organizers will be there and will support and help advise and stuff and equally the whole community that most of the races have incredibly good like facebook groups where people will openly just share and discuss and talk about things you know gear ratios geeky stuff um and can give advice and all that kind of thing and and people who've done the races before are very happy and willing to give it it's a very lovely part of the sport <laughs> i uh, i really enjoy the finish line you know i think that we're all the same at the finish line we've all got there you know some a little bit quicker than others um but we've all got <clears throat> our story that same journey on yeah exactly the same roads on exactly the same mileage um the probably the same problem what was, what was that sorry and so many stories, there are so many stories to tell yeah it's just so nice to the finish line and listening to everybody's because you sort of realize that in that moment you're kind of the same you know it's okay you've got home a, a day quicker than them or whatever but um the stories are, are cool and, uh, and interestingly, like I, I had to come home from the finish line and, you know, there were people that finished a week after me. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I followed their dots and, and, uh, and since then I've had personal conversations with these people that I've never met on Instagram or, or whatever, um, you know, and, and we've shared the, the same journey. We never met on the race, um, but we have since. So you have that connection from the shared experience at the end of the day, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Now, what um, I'm going to ask you both one like real highlight of the race, one highlight of the whole race that you did. I know that's also quite often really hard to answer because there's normally about ten different things that you just remember, but there's got to be one. I, I have the same highlight every time I do a big event is, and this year it was particularly cool that my kids who were six and nine got up at half past three in the morning to come and see me at the finish line. Oh man. Uh, that was, you know, a standout moment from this year's race. You know, obviously I was super chuffed to, to have won the thing. Um, but to share the, share the moment, um, is, is really cool. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's really, I can imagine I don't have kids. I've got nephews, but I don't have kids. I can imagine how good, that can make you feel well, I mean they see what's invested you know yeah. a bit of me that's invested in the race they see that and you know they to some extent there's some sacrifice as well um but yet yeah, they still want to be there to give me a cuddle at the end so so that's a standout memory from uh, this year's kids don't care how much daddy stinks at the end of the day no and, and I really did smell <laughs> <laughs> oh how about you Simone was there like one real standout highlight thing from the race for you yeah, into the race, I think it was a um, uh, gap of Tanlo. I, I loved it so much. Yeah. And as Paul yeah. said, um, my kids wasn't on the finish line, but um, they're really proud of mommy. And it's, um, I think it's a cool thing to see them that, um, um, yeah, as a mom can do... Um, these things and uh, it's it's um, not like the, the usual role model yeah yeah they realize that mom's actually an absolute badass basically <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> it's true no it's really cool I, I i think um 
what's so lovely about ultra cycling is that there there's that connection to family whether it's your direct family um as you both sort of said with your kids uh whether it's the family of the collective of people who are taking part in the event or the race um those shared moments and stories you've all ridden the same route you've all you know traveled the same roads seen the same shit weather but also seen the same amazing weather at times you know you've all been there and experienced it in your own way shape or form at different times and speeds and it's um i think we're really at an incredible time for ultra cycling now where there's a lot of interest um the races are getting crazy quick but also <laughs> The community is sort of so fundamental to the races, which is, is for me, is the biggest attractor. Like, as you both said, the stories you share and discuss before, during, and afterwards are just the things that stay with you for a lifetime. They really, really are. And it creates those friendships. It really does. Yeah, and interestingly, it was, it's almost a byproduct for me that's become the most important thing. Mm. Like I didn't enter my first big race to, to, to have that. I, I entered my first big race to push myself. And uh, and then I found what you've just discussed there, and and uh, you know I've been looking at it at any event now, you know, looking at the vibe as much as the um, as the parkours, if you like. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Um, I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you so much, both of you, for your time, and thank you for uh, indulging in me on your incredible experiences doing a really cool race. Which now every time I talk about it, I'm like, it's going to be on the list. That's next year ticked off then. Um, I'm kind of waiting. I, I, ironically, I did say uh, I'm waiting for it to go to the Isle of Man because I'm half Manx. Yeah. I want to go there. I'd love it. Yeah. I think it'd be amazing. It. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you.